It's time for your Nooner with Dooner, Sean Paul Hampstead, and of course, the great Craig Fuller. And you know it's a big news week if we got a double dose of Fuller up here. It is a big news week, Dooner, um, and an unfortunate one uh, yeah. at that point. You know, it's, it's really interesting because when there are bad things happening or challenging things happening in the market, we get busier on the content side. But to be clear, our business also struggles in times when the market struggles because we obviously sell services and data into the market. So it's just it's a more difficult time uh, for all the industry, including freight waves, just because simply because we are a primary uh, participant in the market, just like every other technology company that sells services. But from a news week, it's obviously a really important and big news week. It is an important biz news week. It's an important and big day for my mom. She just got out of surgery. I heard she's okay. A little cowbell for you. We've got awesome guests today. We've got these two gentlemen on. We're going to be talking about Convoy. We're going to be talking about the brokerage winter. We've got Chase on from Edison Motors. They've got a brand new EV for the vocational trade. Uh, he's making some big traction over there. We got Mr. Supply Chain, who's hanging out in the green room to debate about the freight recession. No, he's going to talk about continued learning and some of the impact. And actually, with all these job losses we're hearing about, it might be a good time to go get a certificate and uh, bolster up your career opportunities. And Ryan Schreiber, he's going to tune in from uh, Technovations and tell us what uh, people are saying out on the street about You have Convoy. got a heck of a lineup today. A lot of people on today. We got a tip AIT and we'll talk a little bit about Convoy and Brokerage Winter. Looking for a new adventure? Take the next step on your career journey with AIT Worldwide Logistics. When you join their growing team, you'll collaborate with expert colleagues around the world to create innovative solutions backed by world-class customer service. If you're ready to push the supply chain envelope, your next adventure is waiting. Visit the career section at AITWorldwide.com to learn more and apply today. Um, JP, when we, when Craig and I were last on here, we, uh, if you guys didn't see this, but scrambling beforehand, right before we went on, Craig's like just waiting for this uh, notification to come in from Convoy, a statement to read. He ends up jumping on the show, and we didn't have full clarity on the situation. We obviously suspected exactly what was going to happen that did happen. Dan Lewis sent a letter yesterday uh, excusing everybody from the company except for a strategic team to sell off, and now you're saying there might actually be a buyer for that? Yeah, um, it sounds like that they are trying to retain the technology team and that there are a couple, uh, at least a couple of incumbent logistics providers who are taking a really close look at uh, the software that Convoy has built, not only the driver app, but you know, TMSs uh, for dispatch, uh, for, for the shipper portal, and a lot of that back-end um, matching and pricing engines, which were actually, you know, ended up being some of the most sophisticated technology in the, in the brokerage industry. People, people are fig- trying to figure out, you know, does it make sense for us to bolt this on to a brokerage we already have? Does it make sense for us to, you know, try to expand our capacity network? And so, um, yeah, I think they're still in conversations with a couple of potential buyers. Um, they, ex- what I've heard is that they expect to figure out whether they can do a deal in the next like week or so. Um, but yeah, there's, there's still, pieces of this company that, that have value and that, that people are interested in. Craig, a couple of days to let this news set, sit in. I know that you uh, you talked to Dan. You're very familiar with the team. We're very familiar with Convoy over here. In fact, just a couple of weeks ago, this is a collector's item now, I was named one of their hall stars. I got a baseball card from them. They're still doing marketing. Things are still humming along over there. And now we are where we are today. What's your takeaway from this whole situation? Yeah, to be clear, I haven't actually talked to Dan. We okay. exchanged text messages, just uh, told him, hey, I'm sorry this is happening. Um, and so, but, you know, having a sense for where the business is at, um, you know, it, I, I think we have to sort of back up and look at how we got here. Yeah. You know, so many folks in freight have been looking at the convoy business model with both um, sort of awe on how they were able to successfully raise so much capital, uh, but also a little bit of uh, sort of questions on how sustainable those capital raises were. And if you think of co- the convoy business model, Convoy built a business model at a time when there was zero cost of capital or very low cost of capital. The ZERP environment is what people like to describe it as, the zero interest rate uh, environment that the Federal Reserve had instituted. The capital was cheap, and it enabled Convoy and other freight brokers to really achieve high growth because the cost of borrowing money or taking an equity investment uh, was really low. And the problem is now we're in the most significant increase in terms of time and speed of interest rates in history. 
And that model of building a business with cheap capital just doesn't work anymore, particularly in an industry that operates with very low margins. And so Convoy went out and uh, raised a bunch of capital. They borrowed capital, as we've seen in, in recent reports, uh, to really build this high growth model. And what's happened is they were not able to achieve the level of margin to support uh, the, the cost of the debt that they had acquired, as well as the cost of the infrastructure. Now, here's one of the things that I think is important to point out, is that um, Convoy built, with a lot of that investor capital, one of the most, as, as JP pointed out, one of the most substantial and sophisticated technology platforms in the business, and arguably more sophisticated than a lot of the other players and incumbent players who are out there. They didn't have the fallacy or the challenges of taking an existing incumbent tech stack and trying to overlay something on top of it. They built it from scratch and spent a lot of capital doing that. For whoever ends up with this platform, they're gonna, it's gonna be a massive win for them because they don't have to actually have spent all that money. They'll get it at a far discount and they can then basically create uh, they have a successful business model and use that technology layer to sort of layer into their existing business. I think it's going to be pretty tremendous for whoever ends up with these assets. You know, there's a lot of there's been a lot of people dancing on Convoy's grave. There's been that side of people online, but I think Matt Silver had a great takeaway from this whole situation. He said the best thing that I think Convoy did is that it brought some serious tech talent into the freight industry. There are so many insanely smart people who Convoy attracted. Having that Amazon lineage, that that background there, and bringing people into the fold. JP, would you agree with that? You think that that has encouraged people to join the industry? Certainly, and I hope that um, they stay around. Like I, I hope that uh, you know people who work together in Seattle uh, with their colleagues and enjoy their time there, you know, continue to you know stay on the same team, right, and and, and tackle new projects. And hopefully, we'll see um, new companies come out of this. Dan, in his letter to staff, he, he said, said Craig, Craig, that we're in the middle of a freight recession, recession contraction in the capital markets, all of that combined together. together. It was the perfect, the perfect storm. storm. That, would, that, would, that would sort of imply this isn't exclusive to Convoy. Are we in for a brokerage winter that doesn't just touch freight tech? Absolutely. So this is a story that I've been working on for a couple of months, um, is this concept of what they call asset-based uh, lines of credit or using financing essentially to grow. So let's think about how the freight market, so brokerage is a really relatively young industry. A lot of people that are new to this industry don't realize, frankly, how, freight, how young freight brokerage is. I mean, it was illegal to freight broker until 1980 because the, the market was not deregulated. And it really came on uh, in force, first started as a cottage industry and really, after you know, 2008, after the financial crisis, is when we saw really high growth in the freight brokerage industry. It started to come on in terms of substantial volume and substantial sort of market share uh, in the past decade. And now it plays a primary role. When you go back to the days when I was at US Express working the desks, brokers were usually the backstop. It had the freight that was left over, or it was a, a load that if you needed to find a, a backhaul, you could find it. You could call C.H. Robbins or another freight broker up. What we have seen in the last 20 years is that freight brokers play a primary position in the routing guide, which means they're often beating out their asset-based competitors and winning primary positions. That has changed the nature of freight brokerage. And, and if you think about it from a freight brokerage standpoint, it's a far easier to scale a freight broker than it is a trucking company because your only resource that you have to contend with other than computers and software are humans. And uh, what they were able to do, a lot of the freight brokers, because the cost of capital was so cheap, and we're talking about cost of capital, it's the cost to borrow money or the cost to sell equity. It was really, you could get at high equity prices and to borrow money, you could take out cheap loans at low interest rates. Because it was so easy and cheap to do, the, the math worked. They were borrowing money at a couple of percent. You know, think about the old term of LIBOR or, or uh, uh, you know, the, the new term, um, SOFR, which is basically sort of replaced LIBOR. But that is a, an index that banks use to charge capital. And effectively, when those rates went, say, 4.5% to eight and a half to nine percent, which is where we're at, maybe so for plus in some of these cases, uh, even higher, the cost of capital became even higher than the cost of the, or the, the benefit of the margin. So let's go back to Convoy specifically to put this in perspective. We've been told that Convoy was a $500 million revenue company run rate, generating 7% margins. 
So think about that standpoint. So in, on a $500 million, it's, seven, it's $35 million. But if the cost of capital for Convoy was 8 9 10 12%, then they're paying that out. They're actually losing money as they finance those receivables, as, as payables. So as they're financing the receivables from the shippers, they're actually borrowing money that's higher than what their margin is. And because their model was built to grow and use capital to grow and borrow money to grow, um, it became a, a problem where the cost of capital is more expensive. They've added all these resources and infrastructure. That's also more expensive. Compounded with all of the other things that the change in the freight market just meant that this model was unsustainable. You know, when we talk, we talked a lot about the trucking bloodbath, and you can look at this authorities chart we had, and we talk about that big run up. But it's sort of interesting because the new, the new sort of look that we're taking on this is that brokerage side. How much did this play into that? This is all messed up from like 2020. Right? Well, this is absolutely the case, and like Convoy is not the only company that did this. There are, I've talked to a number of banks, uh, bankers that are in the space. I've talked to uh, people that are familiar with the financial situations, and and think about banks. We're not just talking about when I talk about banks, it's not just the, the, the asset-based lenders, it's the investment bankers. They won't talk on record, frankly, because these are typically proprietary things, and they talk about conceptually what they've seen without specifically mentioning names. But what they're actually telling us is that this problem is much bigger than most people realize, and the biggest issues are in that 50 to $250 million brokerage. For the last decade, it has been incredibly easy, and I'm not saying this is easy in the sense it's not hard work, but easy because the math has worked so well, is if I can borrow money and I can hire humans to go out and build a freight broker and be successful brokering freight, then I can scale my business from 50 million or 10 million to 50 to 100 to 200 million, and I can continue to scale that up using money that I don't actually have to have on my balance sheet uh, that I are generated from operations, I should say. And so what was essentially happening is they were borrowing this money, and it would have worked and would continue to work had interest rates stayed at low levels. It almost works indefinitely. The problem is there's not enough margin in these businesses to be able to offset the cost of capital. And so what we have is we have a number of companies, probably measured in dozens of companies, that have gone out and borrowed money and didn't take corrective actions last year when we started talking about the freight recession. They either didn't believe that it was actually happening or thought that they could sell through it, that it would not impact them to the degree that it has. And as you pointed out, this is now impacting everybody. And it's gone on a lot longer than we all expected. If we look at the chart you just had up, uh, Dooner, what we're actually talking about is too much capacity. Mm. And when tender rejections are low, as they are right now, then the pricing power, the control that you have as a freight broker or a carrier, you just lose that entire power base. And I think, you know, if you look at social media, you and I are very active. Actually, all three of us are very active on social media, particularly Twitter. It's been a lot of hate uh, towards the brokers. I don't think people, they think brokers are just making money hand over fist. And that has been true up till a couple years ago. Now we're in a situation where this is the first time in history that we're actually going to see a number of bankruptcies from freight brokers simply because the model of funding your business through debt and through asset-based lines of credit is not sustainable. And unfortunately, a lot of the principals that run these companies have not known an environment where cost of capital had some level of significance. I think the other um, factor here is not just the rising cost of capital, but also just really contracting margin dollars per load that that band of mid-sized brokers that you're talking about Craig a lot of times you know they're sort of caught in between running a super cheap super lean operation with like no support and 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 then you know tr on the other end the very large brokers achieving you know bigger efficiencies with scale those mid-sized brokers may have higher costs to cover a load um, than their mar their margin dollars per load, and that's why I, I talked to um, a, you know a, a founder of a very important you know um, factoring company for the industry, and he said that yeah, you're right, Craig. There's there's dozens of brokers out there that right now their their margin dollars per load do not cover their uh, their cost to cover a load. 
If you look at this chart, this is from Kevin Hill at Brush Pass Research right here. It actually shows the drop-off that's going on. He said growth rates officially turning negative in July of 2023. As of October 1st, 2023, there were 5.6% fewer brokerages active and authorized than there were in October 2022. If you're watching this, you can see a big dip there. In 2014, that corresponds with the uh, rising of the surety bond from 10,000 to 75,000. So aside from that, this is the biggest dip they have in their data. Well, 2014 is also a period of time when we saw a, uh, it was a freight recession. You yeah. know, predating, you know, 2014 was actually the sort of peak of the market, 15 uh, and 2016 was a freight recession. So what we're actually looking at is two things happened. One is we saw uh, a change in the government regulations around the bonds, uh, and then we and the markets sort of resolved that and they came out with different structures. And the second thing that we've seen it, or we saw back then was a slowdown in the freight market, which also discouraged people from getting into it. And so we're now in a situation where it's not a regulatory structure. It is a financing and cost of capital structure with a slowdown in the market. To JP's point, and it was think about the cycle. This is poorly understood by a lot of people that I talk to that are not. Uh, really in the freight brokerage industry because they don't understand really how the market works. So they look at it and say, we need a rebound in the market. We need the freight market to turn up. We need rates to go up. What they don't actually understand what they're saying is that they need, what they're actually will happen is that spot rates are going to go up and contract rates are actually going to stay depressed until we reach a threshold where that spot to contract delta starts to really blend into one another. Right now, we're still at record highs or near record highs of that delta between contract and spot. You know, think about the, the price of how much cheaper it is to move something through the spot market than a contract. Talking about 75 cents a mile cheaper to move it through spot. If we go back to sort of pre-COVID levels, we're in about 45 cents. And so we haven't seen the significant compression in margins yet, but we're on uh, the verge of a new bid cycle that's starting out. And one thing that I was also told by CEO uh, of a very large freight broker this week is that something I didn't appreciate is that shippers, the reason that we've seen contract rates, so Zach Strickland and I in the, the state of freight have been asking, how, why have contract, why is that spread so high in a sluggish market? And one of the things that he pointed out, which I thought was incredibly interesting, is that shippers mandate, a lot of the large shippers mandate a certain percent of their freight is allocated to asset-based trucking companies. So think about 80% of my portfolio has to go to the asset and 20% to the broker. So the brokers are, 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 are basically whittling away at that 20% they're not really touching the 80%. But what he said is that um, the, asset, the large asset carriers ha are not going to cut their rates by 30 cents or 40 cents a mile. They're gonna wait to the next bid cycle. But what he predicted is that those large carriers are gonna have no choice but to cut their rates. And we know the conditions of the market are incredibly soft. So when we look at the next bid cycle, when new bids get uh, put into place, we will see another drop in contract rates. And that is the most dangerous point in a brokerage business because we see margin compression happen. And if we see an elimination of capacity happen at the same time, spot rates go up, contract rates continue to go down, you'll see even more margin compression. That's when this gets really, really ugly. And we could see a wholesale uh, uh, churnout of a number of brokers unless they take decisive action right now. They have to. Uh, that means reducing staff, reducing cost, and really thinking about every penny you spend. And to your point, Craig, the large brokers are probably more contract heavy. Mid I'd say mid sized and large brokers are more contract heavy now than they have been in years past. Um, you know, looking at the JB Hunt results uh, from a couple of days ago, ICS is now 68% contract. A year ago, it was 48%. They're not doing that. Um, you know, that's not random. That's because that's where the freight is right now. And so, brokers that have uh, tried to maintain volumes by bidding aggressively on on these RFPs and th these this awarded freight are are going to feel the burn when um, when uh, spot rates start rising up against them. Craig, before I let you guys go, you put something out on Twitter that has everyone DMing me constantly, and it's that another venture back company might be in trouble. You don't have any more insight, do you? I do. I unfortunately, you know, as an editorial business, I, I regret tweeting that because um, as an editorial business, we actually have to go and have the smoking gun, if you will. We have yeah. to have something that says this. We have a lot of channel checks that have said um, this particular firm uh, is distressed um, and has stopped paying carriers. I can't say it until we get the green light from uh, on the editorial side to actually mention who it is. It is not a major player. It's not, in fact, most people are not even aware that this company is in freight brokerage because they actually built a platform that doesn't do freight brokering 
Uh, but they built freight brokerage as a way to sort of build up liquidity in their marketplace. And so I think a lot of people are like, wait, I've not even heard of this firm. Um, and so when I, because I've told them privately who it is, the problem that we've got editorially is we can't publish it until we have, have done all of our checks. And unfortunately, uh, we can't get anyone to come on record to say, hey, this is, this is actually happening. So um, we can... We do know that this firm has been cut off from multiple financing uh, factoring companies. It will no longer buy the receivables. We've heard from carriers that they're not getting paid, but we have not gotten uh, enough uh, to build the story to actually publish it, which is unfortunate because the other night we actually thought we had everything we needed. All right, well, stay tuned, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us up here. Go check out the State of Freight webinar. Craig is going to great tease for it. It's coming up uh, October 30th. You and Zach Strickland, there it is. State of Freight webinar. Everybody go register now. And uh, Craig will give you clarity. And, and one more thing I'd say. So State of Freight would be great. It's October 30th. But we're going to dive deeply into this conversation at F3. Uh, is what's happening around the freight brokerage industry. So um, we've got a fantastic lineup. Brad Jacobs is going to come uh, speak, uh, talk about his observations as a, uh, a founder that's built, you know, he's built seven billion dollar companies. But we also have people that are in the action every single day. So um, it's a great lineup. Um, it is arguably our best lineup in history, uh, and I'm really excited, and hopefully everybody will be able to come. Well, thank you guys. Have a great weekend, and uh, we'll keep you updated on all these stories that are happening. Thanks, JP. Thanks, Thanks Dan. Have a good day, guys. All right, everybody. Meanwhile, yeah, these are why these guys are getting $170,000 now. Look at this UPS driver going above and beyond with this TV. And this is going to work perfectly unless the government comes. You guys have Porsche Pirates where you are? Fortunately, I haven't. I got a ring doorbell, though. I've never seen like someone come up and try and steal anything. I'm looking for the video. I mean, it would be good for social, especially if, like, person trip. You got the block. Good on you. I don't know. Does FedEx? I used to work with FedEx. I can't say anything bad about them. They were a good company. They are a good company. Sometimes it goes too far. Look what happened to these people. That joke worked. There we go. Come on, guys, time me. Here we go. Hey, UPS, your driver left this package under a doorknob like this, trapped us in our apartment, had to call maintenance to get out. So, hey, sometimes the vigilant works, sometimes it doesn't. But right now, we got Chase Barber, CEO at Edison Motors, and it's exciting time to be, you guys can drop that. It's exciting time to be talking to him. It's an exciting time to, there we go. They had to get the graphics up. Hey, Chase, thank you so much for coming on, man. Uh, a little cowbell for you. The L500 truck has made its debut. You betcha. Hey, thanks for having me back on. Yeah, we uh, we made our debut and we did our first successful hauling of a load. So that was kind of cool. You know, when we we've been talking to you for a few years now, when we first did, there were people who were like, this is just a TikTok joke. They're not really building a truck. And I was like, I don't know. I think he's onto something. He's out there in his in his backyard. He's, you had that blue truck before, which was the retrofit. But you've gone on to a new model, this white one. I think we got some video of it, too, if you guys can roll it. Tell us about the brand new truck. Yeah, this is uh, kind of our brand new truck. We had wanted to design our own from the ground up. We uh, we basically we put a skitter cab, like a bulldozer cab, and a skitter frame onto a truck and called it a truck. <laughs> but there, there we go. So it's uh, it's kind of cool. This is the first one we built right from the frame rails up. Now explain this truck to us. So is this like your traditional EV? Is it like a Tesla Semi? What what does this do that's different than um, some of the other EV trucks we've seen marketed? So it's got a fully electric drivetrain. Everything runs 100% off the electric, but it's got an onboard diesel charger so that you don't have to sacrifice range, really. It, it operates similar to a freight train. When the batteries get low, the generator fires up, recharges the batteries. I like to say that it's a fully electric truck that carries around its onboard, own onboard charger. Now, this is kind of a hard question to answer because, especially in vocational, you could be pulling any amount of weight behind you. But what are sort of the tested ranges of this with a full generator? I mean, as long as you keep diesel in the tanks, you'll keep the range going. That's really it. It eliminates that range anxiety. And it's more similar to, say, a, well, a traditional diesel truck. As long as you keep it fueled up, you can keep going. Interesting. So, so how much is running off the battery here? So does the battery charge and the diesel generator charge it when you need that extra range or how is this thing functioning? You get about two hours of driving off the batteries. The generator fires up and recharges the batteries in about half an hour. If you're sitting still about an hour, if you're driving while recharging. 
Interesting. And so you this- run it for two hours. So you run the electric for two hours, and then you run the generator with the engine on for about an hour. Now, before when you were pitching the blue retrofit to me, you were telling me like, hey, look, this is for loggers. This isn't going to be like your traditional over the road sort of, uh, you know, 53 foot trailer puller. What is the intention of the L500 model? And I think you have one of like the L750 or something like that. Yeah, I mean, the intention is mainly being a heavy vocational. So the L750, we kind of is a tri drive. L500 is a tandem. I mean, it stands for basically your kilowatts that you're putting out to the so this one, the tandem has about 700 horsepower, 500 kilowatts, 700, 750 horsepower. And then out of the tri-drive, we're getting about 1,000 horsepower. So, I mean, this thing moves. This thing really, really hauls weight. So how much like tech we is – well, I was curious. How much tech is on board here? How much are a bunch of Canadian hicks in the backyard putting on here? Because I looked at the inside, and it, it looked kind of fancy. I mean, it's kind of fancy, but really it's not. We kept it as simple as we could. That was our whole motto is let's keep this thing simple. Uh, what we wanted to do is like it's a lot of off-the-shelf parts. We really reduced it down to the fundamental core of what it needed to be. Like the electrical parts are parts that you would find at, say, um, a standard industrial electrical store. The inverters are standard off the shelf. Like we went to just companies that supplied that. We didn't make any specific parts unique to a truck. I mean, we kind of patented the way they all went together. But apart from that, it's relatively simple. It kind of looks like, are you sitting in the middle of that? Like in a, in a Tesla semi kind of arrangement or are you, are you left or right side? Yeah, that's kind of why we did the, uh, the, the center <laughs> seating, to be honest. Tesla semi put a seat in the center and they're like, oh, it's so new and revolutionary to have a seat in the center. And we're like, no, it's not. Every single loader, grader, skidder, bulldozer has had center seating. And they're like, it's so revolutionary because the view is so fantastic in the middle. It's like, no, that's why every piece of heavy equipment does it. So we were joking, if we're making a piece of heavy equipment, like a heavy vocational truck, which is the heavy equipment of the trucking world, we'll just do like heavy equipment does and put the seat in the middle. You know, J- Justin, uh, super trucker, he told me that he talked to you recently and you were out at some truck show and you had some interest in this truck. What did you find out at the truck show? Yeah, we uh, we did a big truck show in Ontario, one for the public and one for the vocational industry. We invited trucking companies we invited bodybuilders, people that make snow plows, concrete mixers, crane trucks, you name it. We invited them out to come see the truck and give us some feedback on what they liked about the truck. Like, what do they like about this? What do they not like? Let's get some feedback. And they got really, really excited. So remember when we were talking, oh, geez, when we started this a couple of years back, we started out with logging trucks. And all of a sudden, we showed this off to the vocational industry, and they started going nuts about the ability to do cool things. So... We're really, really growing and expanding this thing out to include the whole vocational sector instead of just logging. So you said the truck debuted. Does that mean it like someone could buy it now? Or have you have you gone to market? What what does it cost? Do you have any orders? So we're what we're doing right now is some development partnership deals. We're partnering up with five trucking companies. They're essentially buying a truck. They're gonna test that truck in their operation because we're just gonna build five trucks next year. I believe in doing this slow, doing this right, getting those five trucks out into these fleet, getting the data back from that. How do they work? How do they what do we need to change? What do we need to upgrade before we go to the public? So we're selling some trucks, but we're just selling five of them. Well, it looks really cool. Chase, where do I send people who want to learn more information about this truck? Maybe they want to come up to Canada and, and take a test ride. <laughs> you betcha. Um, I would recommend Edison Motors on YouTube as we've documented the entire story of the build from basically frame rails up, Carl up. It's all documented on YouTube and you can see the entire thing. Chase, my next step is to, to get up there and take a ride in this. We got to do this one in person next time. Oh, yeah. You, you, you got to come up here. Honestly, once this thing is like, I knew the electric motors were going to be powerful. Once we grow to 100,000 pounds, like we had 60,000 pounds on the deck of a low bed and it moved that like it wasn't even there. Like it didn't even notice. It did a burnout while having 100,000 pounds on the deck. It still spun the tires when I put my foot into it. Like this thing, this thing is powerful. Like once you drive it, I don't think, I don't think people are going to want to go back to a normal diesel other than the fact that uh, shifting is cool. (laughs) Does the system add a lot of weight to, uh, to the truck? No, um, actually, the weight turned out to be the ex- 
pretty well the exact same. Because you're going with a smaller generator, so instead of running like a C15 or a C18 cat, you're now running a 9 liter. So you go from a 15 liter engine down to a 9 liter engine. So you're losing about 2,000 pounds. The batteries weigh about 2,000 pounds because it's a hybrid. So the reduction in weight on going to the smaller diesel is offset by the battery weight, and it kind of works out neutral. Like the weight of the generator is less than the weight of the um, trot of uh, less than the weight of a transmission. You lose the drive shaft weight. You gain a little bit of electric motor weight and some inverter weight, but you can also go with smaller fuel tanks because you're getting much better fuel mileage. You don't need as big of fuel tanks, and that weight balance is out there. So at the end of the day, the weight balance out, but you still get to take advantage because it's registered as an electric vehicle. So it's it's registered as electric, so you get to take advantage of the electric vehicle regulation that says you can pack an extra 3,000 pounds. Very, very cool. I love I love the journey. I love seeing this become a reality. Everyone go check out Edison Motors. Go check out their journey, like you mentioned on YouTube, and he's got a great TikTok as well. Chase, awesome work, man. Little cowbell. Oh, thanks, man. Thanks. So you got to get you up here. Yeah, you got to come up and try it. All right, we'll talk offline. Take care. All right, everybody, elsewhere. This is my favorite thing to see on the road. There he is. You got to give it to the kid. Give it to the kid. That's a young Ryan Schreiber before he had a beard. <laughs> That's his LinkedIn profile, Ryan Schreiber, right there. <laughs> Speaking of Ryan Schreiber, he's with us here right now. Ryan, what is up, man? No, not much. That actually came up last night that, uh, that I'm catfishing everybody with my uh, with my LinkedIn profile picture. Oh, I didn't know that went public because I've been giving you grief, yeah. like on yeah, that's, text. That's thing. Yeah, it came up <laughs> last night at this TIA event. So I'll, uh, I I got a new one. I'll send it to you through text. I think you'll like it. Oh, beautiful. Well, you're at Technovations. Yeah. I mean, is like Convoy the term, like Convoy buzzing? Is everyone talking about that there? Yeah, I mean, uh, absolutely. I mean, it started, you know, obviously my phone started going off like uh, really early Thursday with uh, with folks kind of like asking what the story was or like, you know, what I had heard and, and things like that. And so uh, there's definitely like a lot of kind of uh, scuttlebutt or buzz around it. Um, it's, it's certainly unfortunate. I mean, I think my my take because you asked or you didn't ask, but you asked me to be on the show. So you get it regardless. I was going to ask. Is, um, yeah, you know, Convoy, um, it, it's sad the way that it ended, um, you know, but there's also a, a part of it that uh, um, you, if you if you have a really public kind of ending in this way, um, you only get that if you had a lot of success, right? I mean, there's a lot of brokerages that go to business that nobody's ever heard of, right? Um, and they took a big chance and objectively, they did a lot of incredibly good things that have changed the industry and will change the industry forever. Uh, and you know, it's unfortunate that uh, you know Craig was talking about uh, when I was sitting in the in the green room here. You know, some of the kind of like broker math and the financial uh, uh, piece of of kind of cost of capital, et cetera. And it's it's unfortunate that a bit of a perfect storm. So, uh, but it has been it has kind of been the talk of the talk of the town, unfortunately. And. You know, I think folks like me are just trying to help, uh, you know, friends that we that we have there or folks that we know there uh, kind of land softly. Yeah, this is a very interconnected industry. And we know a lot of these people. We've talked to a lot of these people. We followed their companies right. grow in their journeys. And we've seen right. the employees come and go to other companies. And earlier I read a, a little bit of what Matt Silver had wrote. And you almost echoed it in what you said. Mm -hmm. And that, yeah, I mean, maybe not everything Convoy did was great. And maybe not every, you know... I think we all know, like with venture capital, obviously you can't in a commodity market like freight, you you can't buy market share. It's going to road. We learn things like that, but we also learn from Convoy mm -hmm. how to market cool, how to look cool, how to bring mm -hmm. in tech talent from Silicon Valley that had never even mm -hmm. considered this industry before. That's right. So I don't think it is. I don't think it's necessarily all bad. Do you think their tech finds a buyer? JP had that article out that people were looking at, and Craig seemed to say, you know, there's something to that tech. There's definitely something to it for sure. I mean, I think you know. You uh, you brought up a good point about um, you know three or four years ago whatever it was when Uber Freight was talking about getting out of out of the freight business you know I wrote an op ed for Freight Waves that said um, where my where my argument was that's really bad for our industry because you know Uber Freight and Convoy are able to bring a light on the industry that has driven a lot of the innovation and investment and most importantly talent uh, to the space that we've seen over the last few years and that's. That's technical people, that's data people, that's product people. And while, again, certainly like 
I think you can look at Convoy and 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 think about some of the strategic things that you might have done differently or ways in which you would have run the business differently. Like definitively, they've built some really, really good stuff. And there were some things that they couldn't figure out or didn't figure out in a time in, in a fast enough way, or there were certain sort of strategic decisions maybe they made about investment, but like you don't make an omelet without cracking a few eggs. And so they've built some really, really impressive things that I do think will find a home. And I certainly hope that they find a home because I think it'll be good for the space. But, you know, for me, it's a very sad day, both because I have friends, you know, in leadership at Convoy and also because, um, you know, I think that that it's it, 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 it creates kind of a negative um, light on technology, technology investments in our space for, you know, the mid market and long tail brokers who now maybe look at it and say, well, maybe I don't need technology in my business because, you know, they're kind of oversimplifying a very complex problem. So I think that the tech will find a, I do think the tech will find a buyer because, you know, I've, I've, I've seen some of the things they've built and, and they're pretty impressive. You know, now we've seen uh, one of the biggest name DFB digital freight brokerages go under with Convoy. Flexport, a lot of trouble. Dave Clark in, Dave Clark out, 20% of staff last Friday. Uh, Peterson in wartime CEO mode. Does this scare away the investment market from from freight? Uh, I mean, perhaps. I mean, I think that there's also success stories in the space, right? Yeah. I mean, there are companies that are doing okay, that are growing, that are making money, uh, both that are um, sort of more digital brokers and uh, legacy traditional businesses that are um, going through digital transformations that are really large organizations. That doesn't get as much light, right? And so uh, I think that that's a really important concept. Venture, private equity, those are businesses of risk. And so while they, you know, while they're not maybe as like risk tolerant as they claim to be, there are still businesses of risk. And sometimes these things happen. And I think that the that community is very intelligent. They're smart. It may for a short time dissuade them, as Craig was talking about, that delta between contract and spot rates and some of the kind of perfect storm elements, as as Dan said in his uh, in his letter. You know some of those perfect storm elements that that might dissuade investment for a time, but the reality is we are still a very antiquated business when it comes to data and when it comes to technology and when it comes to kind of operational efficiency. It it doesn't take um, much to make a meaningful improvement in our businesses, right? And so that creates a lot of opportunity and a lot of opportunity to make a lot of money. So. I think that you will still see that investment. You'll certainly for a short time see an investment in companies that have strong foundational unit economics. But over time, as, as the industry improves, those investors are smart uh, enough to, to, to really realize that, there, that there's opportunity here. There'll, there'll be failures, right? What's the, uh, what's the flavor of the month at, uh, at Technovations right now? Is it AI? What are people, what are people excited about now? Yeah, I mean, the entire conference, all people are talking about is artificial intelligence. I mean, just hard stop. Uh, it's it's all about AI right now, and uh, almost to a almost to a fever pitch, almost to a fault. I think that what we're talking to people about, and what we're trying to caution people here, uh, Grace from Freight Waves and I just did a panel uh, here a little bit ago, and my main thing was I wanted to talk to everyone about AI readiness, right? So. AI is a big thing. It's it's a big thing, right? It is a big thing. It's it's meaty to wrap your hands around. We need to focus on AI readiness uh, as an industry and as individual businesses. And so uh, that's really the stuff that we can be doing right now. Um, and that that's the kind of the, the talk of the town. Which ones will we be reporting on that have gone bankrupt in about two years from now? Which companies? <laughs> yeah, which AI companies? There, is this like a Festivus thing? Like I, I have don't problems know. with you people, and I, you got to hear about it. You know, <laughs> um, I. <laughs> There's got to be a few. There's got to be some. I mean, it seems so much like the new flavor. Like I'm sure there's some good AI, but it also sounds like eh, the new thing. I mean, sure, Duner, but like Jeff Bezos has also said that eventually Amazon's going to die. Every business dies in one way, shape, or form. They go bankrupt. They go out of business. They get acquired. Like every business goes away. It's to quote the Sir Elton John, "Circle of Life." 
right? Yeah. That's what happens. And so I think that, uh, you know, I, I think that kind of trying to predict who's going to go out of business. And, and I certainly think on social media right now, there's a lot of like people who've never taken a risk never done anything in their lives, never tried to do anything in their lives, you know, are dancing on the graves of some of these businesses that did incredible things. Um, and so, man, I, you know, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. There'll certainly be some, and it's the ones who either, um, are too reactive. And so they make big bets on something that doesn't make sense because they're waited too long to really focus on sort of incremental improvement, like blocking and tackling or ones who just reject it out of hand. Um, and so I don't think that the fear mongering around going out of business is, is necessary. And I'm not saying that's what you're doing, Tim, but, no. um, I'm, uh, no, I'm not fear. -mongering. I'm just saying some of these AI will inevitably go out of business. It's obviously the flavor of the month. Some of these people have no idea what they're doing and they're just trying to sell a new thing into a market. I'm not saying all of them. But, I'm just saying there's, there's gotta you know, be a few. I, I know what you mean, but you know what, to be honest with you, some of it comes down to not even necessarily how good the technology is. I work with a lot yeah. of early stage businesses, as you know, and some of the best technology that I've seen, um, ends up going away because they can't figure out how to sell it. Like, or they're too early, right? Nikola Tesla was, you know, Nikola Tesla died penniless by himself in a in a hotel room. And now we celebrate him as a visionary because he was just too early on a lot of things. And so, you know, it, going out of business can also just mean wrong place, you know, or, you know wrong place, wrong time. Would you rather be That's a hero when you're alive or when you're dead, Ryan? Alive. I mean, yeah. when I'm dead, like, who cares? You know, right? Like... Right. No, I'm with you. <laughs> You're dead. Who cares, man? Well, you know, I'll leave okay. you with a quote. It's Dr. Grant from Jurassic Park. He said, life finds a way. And I think that's kind of your, your theme over there. Or I would say that's a mistake. I see that now. And that, you know, John Hammond. John, yeah, that that's true. He got In the book, he gets eaten by compoys at the end. The book's a little bit better than the movie. Oh, uh, yeah, the book's way better. Hey, I, I agree. mean, the well, movie is my favorite, one of my favorite movies of all time. Don't get me oh, wrong, yeah. but the book is great. Yeah, for sure. Dude, no, people don't understand this, but like it, CGI was not that. I mean, Terminator Two came out, and that was like mind blowing. But then, like this, and you saw that uh, the first scene with that brontosaurus. The it was like everyone in the theater took their like was taking their sunglasses. I don't know why you'd be wearing sunglasses. They were taking their eyeglasses off. To I was because you know because my my future was too bright back then. But you know now it's a lot dimmer, so I don't wear my sunglasses as much. But you know the dinosaurs were only on screen for like seven minutes yeah. in the original movie, and that's part of the reason they think it worked. So. Yeah. Well, the, the CGI looked better in that one than all the other ones that came after it, too. But maybe it's because yeah, of that totally limited great. exposure. Well, Ryan, thanks so much. How do totally. people find uh, How do people find and connect with you? Right now, they can find you at Technovations, but when they leave. That's right. Just find me on LinkedIn as, you know, Ryan Schreiber, Ryan B. Schreiber. Uh, I don't look like this, as we talked about. I'm catfishing people. Or find me on Twitter, underscore user prime, um, you know, or just like walk up to me on the street somewhere. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You and your red beard have a great week. Hey, buddy. Take it easy, too, sir. Man. All right. Hey, take a look. I was getting, let's, let's get bulk shipping. I got to go back to Spider Man. We didn't have a chance to do Spider Man. Today is Spider Man Day. We can't miss it. You guys got the opening Spider Man clip. We can regular a little strap work here. Take a look at what happened in Sydney, Australia, because Spider Man 2 is out today on PS5. My kids were going crazy about it. They didn't want to go to school today. They didn't want me to go to work. I just wanted to sit home and play Spider Man 2 on PS5. And this has, in this game, you got Venom in it, so like, you know, Venom stands going crazy, 90s kids going crazy. You got Miles. Miles was in the 2018 one. The 2018 one is a masterpiece. Uh, they did a remastered one in 2020 on the PS5, and now it's out on PS2. You get to play as both characters. Fully uses the SSD. Beautiful 4K. It's got ray tracing. Uh, I can't wait until the kids get home we can play. All right, but right now I got to talk to Mr. Supply Chain to kill some time until I can get home and play Spider-Man 2. And he's here with us now. Mr. Supply Chain, what's going on? That, I, I'm just here for killing time. Well, it's good to know, you know, where I said, I, I got to say, Dooner, just for the record, Ryan Schreiber is already my hero. He is so, your hero. Right, right. How did, how did he I, become? I got to see Ryan and, and Grace, we, we were at uh, CSCMP uh, a couple weeks ago. Now, you have the most um, ridiculous I, badge I've ever seen in my life. Um, is that like a prop that you bring with you? Or do people just hook you up with about 37 ribbons? No, it's it, you know, it just happens every year at that conference. You know, they, um, I, I, I love it. You know, CSCMP gives out these little ribbons to, so you can affiliate, right? You can, you can social message the things that you've done. Um, and it just turns out I've been around for a long time doing lots of different stuff. And so I end up with a ton of ribbons. Um, so, uh, one of my friends suggested actually they should have a, a ribbon 
for the guy with the most ribbons. And because, you know, then I could add that one to the mix, too. That's like a, a deadly loop. That's like a paradox. By the way, I, I like your Optimus Prime popcorn tin. Obviously, you went to see the movie at the theater. Good times. Your fault. Your fault. It is Made my fault. I, I, I know. I don't even get a kickback on most of the stuff I promote. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Ridiculous. I should have got I should have got three dollars in Optimus Prime truck, especially with how much they charge these. Now, you showed up on the show at a very interesting time and actually maybe a very good time because a lot of employees recently have lost their jobs. A lot of employees that are in some big name companies, the Flexports of the World, Convoys of the World, and they're going to have to start making some career decisions. Right. Is now the right time to get into continuous education? Is now a good time to sort of build that other side of your career? Well, uh, Dooner, you know the hashtag I use all the time is always be learning, right? Yeah. So if you're going to ask me, the answer is it's, it's always the the right time to be learning. Um, but when you, when you and I talked about uh, coming on the show, you know what what came to mind to me is just sort of in terms of mentoring and career coaching, I, I think it's useful for for folks always to be thinking about certificates, certifications, licenses, and degrees, right? And and depending on where you work in the supply chain. There, there's stuff in all four of those categories that can open up opportunities, and, and sometimes it's required. Um, big thing just within the last couple of weeks that that's really useful for a lot of the folks that that maybe you know um, looking at beefing up their skills right now or exploring some new opportunities. We've just announced a partnership between CSCMP, the Council of Supply Chain Management Professionals, and LinkedIn Learning, and the way this works is there are now eight supply chain certificates that you can earn on LinkedIn Learning that are endorsed by CSCMP. So you go up, you take like four hours worth of training in transportation. You get to the end of it, you get to take an exam, you get a certificate from CSCMP. Um, there, there's one for warehousing, there's one for demand planning, forecasting sorts of stuff, there's one for purchasing. Um, what I love about it, first of all, if you've got access to LinkedIn Learning through an employer, through your public library, through a university, that's free. That's just a thing that's available to you now. But you just can go try it. We've got the the, the link that we're sharing. Um, if you don't have access to LinkedIn, you can sign up for a 30-day free trial. So for somebody that's you know, m maybe just gotten laid off, actually, there's a way to sign up for a free trial and, and spend the next 30 days doing that training, getting those certificates costs you nothing. You will learn a ton. I promise you. There is so much stuff uh, in, in those courses. What are these? Uh, so that, like, uh, so, so hold on. So let me talk for a second here. This is my show, Daniel, and I yeah. demand some answers. What are these certificates? Like, what, what, what am I going to learn? Um, so, for example, in the transportation certificate, uh, the courses you go through, um, it includes some stuff basic transportation stuff, right? Difference between LTL, FTL, ocean shipping. What is an Inco term? But then it gets into some more advanced stuff like, well, how do you do transportation modeling in Excel, right? If you've got um, three distribution centers and three customers, how do you decide how many shipments should go from each distribution center to minimize your total costs? You get hands-on experience through the courses doing those kinds of models, and then you have to take a test showing that you actually learned it. Ooh, interesting. So... How like how does it work? Like I, I go inside because we we hear about these. I've, I've thought about taking certificates, and, and like in my head, I get like the you know just too much noise, and I'm like I don't know what to do. I don't know what to sign up for. I don't know which one to take. I, I don't even know if it's going to to help me. Sell me on this. Why why would this even help me? Um, uh, you know I I think there are three reasons for for anybody to do a certificate certification degree. Um, one, I think it's totally legitimate to just say, listen, I want to prove to myself that I, I know something. I want to learn something new and, and, and I want to validate that I actually learned it. So taking a class and then taking a test helps you get that done. Um, I think the second thing is sometimes it's useful to be able to prove to other people that you've done it, right? So, um, you know, I can feel like I'm smart about something, but if I get a certificate from CSEMP, well, that gives me some credibility, like if I'm talking to Dooner to say, I, you know, somebody else thinks that I know this stuff, too. Um, the third one, and honestly, I think this is the one that a lot of people focus on, is, you know, having a certificate or a certification or a degree that shows that you've got the skills, that you've demonstrated the ability to do something, that can be worth money, 
right? That can get you a job. That can get you a raise. Uh, it gives you some leverage to negotiate with your boss. So I don't know, Dooner, you know, maybe if you get the CSCMP transportation certificate, you can go back and arm wrestle with Fuller, right? And, and you know, see about that raise for next year. Over the top at F3. I like it. I like it. Did the, hey, did the pandemic cause you to have to like furiously re-edit your book Supply Chain for Dummies? Uh, we did. We we cranked out. Actually, you've got a picture of the second edition up on the screen. Uh, we did a revision, and the, the third edition has the green cover, um, uh, a nice little toilet paper case study in there, uh, and, and we we even were able to slide in something about the Ever Given and the Suez Canal. Um, the 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 things that really changed, though, um, a lot more focus on risk and resilience, right? Um, and then um, just so much of the technology is changing so fast that, that we, we had to add a, a bunch of new information about that. Do you have, like, you, you teach some students, you have the, the certificate thing. Like, what's the most popular? What, what do students want to know about? What certificates are people taking? You know, it's, it's really individual. So, you know, I, I used to get this question a lot. Hey, which certification should I get so that I can get a job? And my answer, and, and you know, I, I, I know I sound like a consultant or a professor, but but the answer is, well, it, it depends. What have you done? What do you like? What are you good at? What do you want to be doing? What I did, though, is I created a, a whole LinkedIn learning course that um, talks about a bunch of the different certificates and certifications and education op and options that we have in supply chain. And, and it's really designed in a way that you can go in and say, okay, you, you can kind of plug in. There's like a worksheet where, you know, you can be like, well, here's what I've done. Here's what I want to do. Here is sort of an educational pathway and some experience ideas that will help me bridge that gap. Um, that's a great course. It has been viewed hundreds of thousands of times. Actually, there's been so much changing in the supply chain certification space right now. I'm headed out to California next week to record an update to that course. Um, I can, you know, now I can throw in the, the new CSEMP stuff. Um, ASCM has a, a new certification about supply chain transformation coming out. So there's just a bunch of new stuff in that space. Great question, Dooner. Really complicated answer because it's different for everybody. But the good news is I talk about it in the book and I talk about it in the LinkedIn learning course. Um, there, there are lots of great options out there. It just depends on what you want to do when you grow up. Well, you are pretty smart. So in good news, bad news, we're going to find out if you can solve some of these supply chain problems I've picked out for you. Hit the bumper. All right, Daniel. Bad news. There's a falcon loose in your warehouse. But good news. You've got a falcon stuffed animal. Roll the clip. No. Any sound. If you look above my head, there is a bird right above my receding weird patchy. Oh, it moved. It's actually a hawk, and I'm trying to get it out of our building with this falconry device. But it's been stuck in our building now for uh, <laughs> for two days, and we can't get it out, despite us having all the proper tools. Um, please uh, reply with uh, suggestions to get this beautiful falcon. It's huge, man. It's like so beautiful. I uh, had to get it out of our warehouse. <laughs> okay, that, that's my friend. That's my friend Molson Hart. What the, exactly? The, what What are the proper tools for <laughs> Molson to get that out of there? Well, as I was hoping, I was wondering if you probably had a suggestion for him. I thought like the stuffed animals seemed like a good idea, but it doesn't look like it was falling for the decoy. No, nah, I, you know, I, th I think squirrels are probably, you know, something like if, if you can get like trained squirrels to like r keep running out the door, maybe, maybe the hawk will go after them. No, I saw a video on X before I went on air and it was like these Asian guys were having a party, right? And they're under like a gazebo and there's a light at the top and there's all these bugs going to the light. So this one guy, he took the light on his cell phone, right? They turned the light off in the gazebo, took that, all the bugs started following him and he walked him over to a street light, then turned his off and they went to the street light. Now, it's unfortunate that hawks don't perform like those kind of bugs because that would be like a great method. Dude, that's awesome. I am so going to try that. Uh, someone in the back had a suggestion, but I didn't quite catch it. <laughs> oh, a robot rat. He thinks a robot rat could do it. Or maybe what about a remote control airplane? 
a hundred percent. You, you know, you 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 could do like a, a little remote control car with a stuffed squirrel on top. Um, you totally make that happen. That could get it out. Um, Molson, Mol- I, Molson's in your neck of the woods, right? We can go over and try it this weekend. No, he's over in uh, Texas. He's like in the Austin area. Ah. Yeah, a little, okay. little, little too far from Chattanooga. I'd love to get his warehouse, though. I got to go to a bunch of places. I got to go up to Edison. I got to go check out Molson's warehouse and all the Falcons over there. All right, let's talk about some marketing. I don't know. You to Canada because yeah, I, I'm I don't... a huge fan of the Edison stuff. I love well, those trucks. Here's some good news. Here's some good news. Some freight companies have gotten interesting with their market. The bad news is a year later, the guy who came up with the campaign got fired. Let's take a look at this flock freight ad. People are always wondering, why is shipping less than a truckload of freight so painful? And how much is a load in terms of dimension? Let's say a shirt and shoe shingle has to ship a load of shirts and shoes. Shipping a load of shirts and shoes, can a shingle shutter? Fortunately, the geniuses at Flock Freight have figured out shared truckload technology. With their shared truckload mode, even if your company only has a load of stuff to ship, Flock Freight will ship it with the same level of service as a full load size shipper. Saving your company money while delivering on time and avoiding damage and loss. It's a load shipped like a load. Mystery solved. Flock Freight, experts in shipping any kind of load. So, Daniel, I actually think it's a pretty funny ad. They use Steve from Blue's Clues. The only problem, the bad news here is they spent uh, over a million dollars on it, and it only got about 2,000 views on their TikTok. They've decided to move on from this marketing team, and they've decided to add some inside sales people instead. <laughs> it's a great ad. I agree with you. I love it. But, but, um, but, but price matters, right? Yeah. I, you know, my thing is, like, like what the truck on TikTok, we get 30,000, 100,000 views. Like what they should have done, instead of spending millions to Steve from Blue's Clues, they should have gone to someone like me and just had me do the stupid copy. I would have cost a lot less and I, you would have been having me put this out into a market. Although, I don't know, flock for, because my problem is during the commercial, I'd want to be like, isn't, I'd want to keep yelling the whole time, like LTL already exists, partials already exist. <laughs> like, this, isn't, this isn't new. <laughs> I, I will tell you, I, I had a conversation years and years ago over at the University of Arkansas, where I'm now teaching. And I was in a room with a bunch of executives and somebody, one of the shippers was complaining about, you know, all, all the issues with, with wasted space and full truckload shipping. And we had somebody in the room from ABF who said, may I humbly suggest that we have a solution to this problem? <laughs> He's like, we have this thing called LTL. (laughs) Well, speaking of solution, so labor solution and warehouses, Amazon has debuted their digit robot. This robot is five foot, roll the tape. This robot's five foot, nine inches tall. He weighs 143 pounds and can carry up to 35 pounds. You think you could take it in a street fight, Daniel? (laughs) You were talking about this with Britain the other day. It, 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 right, this is, uh, they're, they're taking on Boston Robotics. Um, I want to I want to see the thing dancing now and and doing uh, a Sam Adams ad. Yeah, this is a partnership with uh, Agility, these digit robots. And it's really interesting because like you like right now, warehouses are obviously optimized for people, like for people to pull all of their stuff. And the robots now are optimized for a people world because they have to be. You can't get too far ahead of it. But it's really interesting to think what like a warehouse may look like or at least an Amazon warehouse will look 10 years from now. You know, I hear so many people talking about, you know, AI and robotics and like, oh, that's never going to replace people. And, you know, that that's it. And then you look at the video and you're just like, yeah, OK. I mean, if if if, if you don't see what's happening and, and accept that, you know, this is a technology that, uh, frankly, I, I mean, it, it it's viable today. It may not be cost effective, but those unit economics are going to get radically better. Um our business is going to change on the trucking side, on the warehousing side, in in, a, in big ways. You know, whether it's ten years or twenty years, um, they're going to still be huge opportunities for people. But it's not doing all the same things that we do as human tasks today. It's just not. Yeah, can, can it play reverse basketball? Show this clip. This is going to take over pickleball, <laughs> Daniel. This is the new version of basketball. You put the hoop uh, what is on this? the pole, and then you score by throwing the oh, net no. at the ball. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh man, Daniel, unfortunately we're out of time. We'll have, maybe at F3 we can play a little reverse basketball. 
People go look up Mr. Supply Chain Daniel Stanton. You can find him on X. You can find him on LinkedIn. You can Google Mr. Supply Chain. You'll bring him right up. You can find me at Timothy Dune. That's D-O-O-N-E-R. You can find the show at FW What the Truck on all your social media platforms. You want to watch the show, look up What the Truck wherever you get your podcasts on audio platforms or on Freightways YouTube. There's an entire What the Truck playlist with all 643 episodes of this wonderful show. Take care. Don't be a stranger.